Bergmann on my name is Uwe Bergmann on behalf of the Slack public lecture series it is my great pleasure and true honor to introduce today's speaker um, this is the first lecture of the 2008 season our next lecture will be uh, in at the end of April um, uh, please check for the information. Roger Kornberg is a professor of structural biology at Stanford University School of Medicine. He also holds an honorary degree at Ume University in the north of Sweden. Uh, this university is about three degrees below the Arctic Circle and he only goes there in the summer. After receiving his bachelor degree at Harvard and his PhD at Stanford University, uh, he went to Cambridge, England to do his postdoctoral research with Aaron Klug and Francis Crick. After that, he moved back to the other Cambridge, to Harvard, where he was an assistant professor before joining the Stanford faculty. Among his numerous awards, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in the year 2006 for his studies of molecular basis of eukaryotic transcription, which explains the process by which genetic information from DNA is copied to RNA. We are, of course, very proud here at SLAC that Roger's work was in part carried out at our synchrotron. In fact, Roger has been using the Stanford synchrotron since more than 25 years. His last beam time ended a week ago, and I should remind him his next beam time starts on March 12th, and I was told he still has to hand in his beam time request form, please. <laughs> uh, otherwise, we might have to cancel it. His father, Arthur Kornberg, received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1959. And his work was also on how genetic information is transferred from one DNA molecule to another one. Roger has a younger brother who discovered polymerase 2 and 3. DNA polymerases 2 and 3. So all three Kornbergs have worked to understand how genetic information is put to use in cells. Maybe then Roger can tell us tonight if winning a Nobel Prize lies in one's genetic makeup. <laughs> so please welcome Roger Kornberg and let me uh, ask you to welcome him for his lecture tonight from Adams to Animals, the Vital Force of biology. Is this live? Can I be heard? Yes. So first of all, I thank you for such a kind introduction indeed for the invitation uh, to come tonight. Uh, it is indeed a journey, uh, as you have indicated, uh, of gratitude because of all that I owe to the uh, staff uh, and others at Slack who were so helpful in accomplishing what I'll describe uh, towards the end of the hour. Uh, I'll begin in more general terms. Uh, first, I should remark that, uh, in case anyone is concerned, the Nobel Prize is neither hereditary nor contagious. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, I don't think that anyone need be alarmed. Uh, those in the other room are perfectly safe as well. Uh, now, <coughs> I should say that I heard uh, a wonderful public lecture uh, given recently by Paul Nurse, uh, pre the president of Rockefeller University, uh, himself one of the discoverers of the basis of the cell cycle uh, in eukaryote organisms for which he received the Nobel Prize in medicine uh, about a decade ago. And I thought that the way in which uh, Nurse framed his lecture would form a marvelous introduction to what I have to tell you tonight. The title of Nurse's lecture was Great Ideas in Biology. 
And as he explained uh, at the outset uh, in somewhat apologetic terms that might, regard, might be regarded by physicists as an oxymoron, uh, the, the reason for saying that, in case not all of you know, uh, a very well-known physicist once remarked to me, contrasting physics with uh, biology in which, as you know, one is really s uh, overwhelmed with detail, uh, he said, uh, physicists, ha physicists hate facts. Now, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> if that's entirely the case, but of course what he meant by that is that uh, physicists especially uh, seek principles, they seek uh, indeed great ideas. Uh, and as Paul uh, remarked in his lecture, uh, one, uh, because biologists revel in detail, uh, sometimes the fact they too have over the years contributed important ideas is sometimes lost. So the subject of Paul's lecture was four great ideas in biology. Now those of you who are biologists or have any knowledge of the subject may immediately set yourselves uh, the challenge of thinking what four ideas he might have uh, settled upon to describe to the audience that evening. Um, I'll, I'll tell you in the course of these first few minutes, as I say, by way inter of introduction to the rest of what I have to describe. Uh, the first of the great ideas to which Paul alluded was that of the cell. Now, I need to figure out how to work this. Which is the button for the, uh, the laser? That way, right? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. This is, uh, I think, an idea well known to almost all of you. Uh, a cell is your, I think this is going to be a problem. A cell is your doubtless aware. <laughs> a cell is uh, the unit of life. And uh, there are, as you know, very many cells in a human uh, on the order of 10 to the 14th cells in a human, which is 100 trillion cells, a very large number. You may wonder why such a large number, why not fewer larger cells? Uh, there's much that lies behind that. Uh, it's actually a very deep and meaningful idea, and there won't be time to explain in detail. Uh, rather, what I'd like to focus on is uh, very briefly, uh, the history of the idea, because it relates uh, to the main purpose of my lecture. So the cell theory, as it is called, uh, namely uh, the notion that we are composed of very many cells, was only elaborated in the middle part of the 19th century. But cells as entities had been described about 200 years before. Uh, so Robert Hooke is credited with having first observed uh, the cells in a section through cork through a microscope and having likened them to uh, the, uh, the rooms in a monastery and thus the name cell. Uh, now the, the major figure of that century relating to the discovery of cells was actually uh, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, uh, who was really an unlikely scientist. He was actually a Dutch tradesman uh, of no personal fortune, no uh, higher education. He possessed no university degrees. He was not a professional scientist. Nonetheless, he made some of the most important discoveries in the history of biology. Um, in particular, he discovered bacteria, he discovered sperm cells, he discovered blood cells, and much more. He really founded the field of microbiology. In 1676, he served as the trustee of the estate of the deceased and bankrupt Jan Vermeer, uh, a painter who may be known to many of you. Uh, and from this it is believed that he was a close friend of Vermeer. And indeed, uh, many of you will recognize on the right-hand side one of the most famous of Vermeer's paintings called The Astronomer. Uh, and it is, has been suggested that uh, the character in this painting is actually uh, von Leeuwenhoek. Likewise, in another of Vermeer's paintings. In 1673, uh, Leeuwenhoek uh, began writing letters to the newly formed Royal Society of London describing observations he made through his own microscopes. In uh, the decade before, he began grinding lenses. 
He proved to be exceedingly adept at that, uh, and also a keen observer with fine eyesight, uh, and was able to magnify objects that he wished to observe about 200 times, and that was sufficient uh, to reveal the important objects to which I've already alluded. In a letter of 1683, he wrote to the Royal Society about his observations on the plaque between his teeth. <laughs> and his words were as follows. I then most always saw with great wonder that in the said matter there were many very little living animalcules, and this was the term for which he's famous that he coined to refer to bacteria and other small cells. Very pretty and moving. The biggest sort had a very strong and swift motion and shot through the water, or spittle, like a pike does through the water. The second sort oft times spun around like a top. In the mouth of an old man, uh, Leeuwen Hook found, quote, an unbelievably great company of living animalcules. The biggest sort bent their body into curves in going forwards. Moreover, the other animalcules were in such enormous water in number, all the water seemed to be alive. Now, these were among the first observations of living bacteria that have ever been recorded. Uh, the observations made by Leeuwenhoek, the discovery of bacteria and the notion of life on this scale is uh, really key to what I have to <coughs> tell you in the course of the hour and a point that I'll return to, and it serves very well by way of introduction. But first, I'll digress briefly to mention, for those who are interested, what were the other ideas uh, to which Paul Nurse referred. They will actually also be pertinent to what I have to tell you. So the second was the idea of genes, and as many of you will be aware, uh, this idea is properly attributed to uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, and as I say, about 200 years after Leeuwenhoek. He was an Augustinian monk who was a high school teacher of science. And his attraction to research was based on a s simple appreciation for and a love of nature. Uh, he was not only interested in plants, but in many other things, but his work in meteorology and other subjects, uh, but his work on plants is what we remember him for. Uh, he wondered how they obtain their particular characteristics, and, in and he wondered about the proposal that had been made that characteristics could be acquired traits uh, that were derived from the environment. So he began by planting two uh, quite different plants alongside one another and asking whether they or their progeny uh, came to have a similar appearance. And of course, what he discovered is quite the opposite. Uh, this experiment was, quote, designed to support or to illustrate Lamarck's views concerning the influence of environment on plants. And of course, what he found was that plants retained their essential traits, uh, the traits of their parents, uh, irrespective of the environment. And so it was this simple idea that gave birth to the idea of heredity. Now then, as you know, Mendel went on uh, to show that traits were inherited in certain numerical ratios, and he derived what were called, uh, and what remain uh, true to this day, laws of genetics. Uh, and I'll just mention uh, s some for those who are interested. First, that hereditary factors, as I've already said, are passed on intact. Uh, second, that each member of the parental generation transmits half of its hereditary factors to each offspring. Uh, and finally, that different offspring of the same parents receive different sets of these hereditary factors. Uh, now, as I have said, this work of Mendel laid the foundation for modern genetics. Uh, he wrote a monograph of experiments with plant hybrids uh, that has become one of the most influential publications in the history of science. But as some of you will be aware, uh, soon after it was published, it was forgotten and only rediscovered about uh, 25 years later. Now, the third important idea to which Paul Nurse referred in his lecture, uh, also pertinent to what I'll have to tell you, uh, was evolution. And this, everyone, of course, connects or relates to the name of Charles Darwin. And now I come to the last idea, and it really forms the most important uh, lead-in to the main topic of the evening, uh, and that is the idea of life as chemistry. Uh, this is something uh, which, like the rest of what I've mentioned, uh, one often takes for granted today, and it is not even recognized in the same way as the other things that I have mentioned as truly a profound idea. But as I'll explain to you, it is the most profound, and it underlies all of the rest of what I have just described, uh, and that is really the burden of what I have to tell you. Now, the 
emergence of this important idea cannot really be credited to a single individual. Uh, there were many who were highly influential and in ways that are truly ironic. Uh, and that's what I'll tell you briefly about Louis Pasteur, uh, who was one of the originators. Uh, Pasteur, like Leeuwenhoek, was an unlikely scientist. He was the son of a poor, uneducated tanner. Uh, nonetheless, he went on to a career in science. And his first and most important contribution uh, despite the great significance of others that I'll allude to briefly, uh, was uh, disproving the idea of spontaneous generation. So disproving the idea that life could arise de novo uh, without any antecedent in a nutrient broth or in a piece of rotting meat or what have you. Uh, in Pasteur's own work, he exposed uh, broiled, uh, 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 sterile, so boiled broth to air in vesicles that either had a filter interposed in the neck uh, to exclude any particles that might enter from room air, or vessels that had uh, a tortuous uh, goose-shaped neck uh, that he himself had blown out of glass, again to prevent dust from entering uh, as the contents of the boiled broth in the flask cooled. And what he discovered is that nothing at all grew in the flask as long as he protected it from the entry of dust particles from the air. And uh, this simple experiment, uh, very well uh, publicized by him, became one of the most important to disprove the theory of spontaneous generation. Now, Pasteur went on to show the important role of microorganisms uh, in very many other processes. So first of all, he showed that microorganisms were responsible for uh, the spoilage of beverages, for the fermentation of uh, beverages, uh, in particular milk. And then from that, he developed the process of heating to kill the microorganisms to a limited extent, today known as pasteurization, and still practiced in the uh, manufacture and distribution of all milk in the world. But that was not all. Uh, from this observation, uh, Pasteur had the idea, uh, which today we, we know as the germ theory of disease. Uh, he was not the, the sole originator of that, but he was a key contributor. Uh, and he and Robert Koch are widely regarded as the fathers of germ theory. Uh, Pasteur himself concluded that microorganisms infected humans and that preventing entry of microorganisms into the human body uh, might prevent disease or infection, and this actually led Joseph Lister to develop antiseptic, antiseptic methods for surgery. So that was another profound contribution. Beyond that, appreciating the role of microorganisms in disease led Pasteur then to take advantage of the observation earlier made uh, on the development of the first vaccine, uh, that against smallpox, and Pasteur then developed a series of vaccines for rabies, for cholera, uh, for anthrax, and more. Now, the most important point about uh, his contribution uh, that, again, comes back to the main theme of what I wish to say uh, relates once more to the fermentation uh, that he recognized in the case of milk and other beverages, including wine, uh, is the work of microorganisms. In particular, in the case of wine, he understood that it was yeast uh, in the crushed grapes uh, that converted sugar to alcohol. And he posed the question whether this process of fermentation brought about uh, by yeast in grape juice actually requires the living yeast. It was a, an intriguing idea to ask whether fermentation could be carried out uh, by some component within the yeast, whether the life of the yeast was essential, uh, or whether some, he thought, perhaps inanimate constituent could also accomplish the task. So he broke the yeast, he uh, uh, disrupted the yeast cells in various ways, and discovered that fermentation no longer occurred. This is one of the most famous mistakes in the history of science, uh, because uh, it led him to a deeply wrong conclusion, namely that fermentation uh, is, essential, is essentially an act of a living thing. Uh, by this discovery, and by the force of 
his own skill in communicating science to others and in discouraging any competitors or those who might object to what he did, he set back the development of uh, modern biomedical science by a generation. Now, it's ironic uh, that he should have concluded that, uh, in this, that, the, that the process of fermentation was not a simple chemical one because Pasteur was one of the most uh, distinguished chemists of his generation. He was first of all a chemist. He was a professor of chemistry. He's, uh, he, was, he made his early reputation by a brilliant experiment in which he uh, explained the rotation of light by molecules. Uh, Pasteur was the one who r first recognized that there could be both left and right-handed molecules, and that would explain their uh, spectroscopic properties, the way in which they interact with light. It was something quite ingenious, uh, which if there were more time I would love to describe. But to return to the point, uh, it was Eduard Buchner, uh, as I say, a generation later, who corrected uh, Pasteur's mistake. And he did so by uh, repeating Pasteur's experiment only with, a, as it happened, and quite by chance, a different strain of yeast and ones whose essential components survived the act of cell disruption to bring about fermentation. Uh, the importance of this experiment was immediately recognized. Uh, Buchner won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for that particular observation in the year 1907. And he wrote, we all grew up in the atmosphere of Pasteur's views. I hence understandably was very skeptical when I obtained experimental facts that appeared to indicate cell-free fermentation. Now, <coughs> a word about fermentation. As I say, uh, it entails the conversion of sugar to ethanol or alternatively uh, sugar to carbon dioxide and water, uh, by either process, uh, energy is liberated. Uh, this is an imp one of the main mechanisms whereby uh, we and other living things uh, derive the capacity for all of our actions, the uh, building of our bodies, everything that we regard as essential for life. What Buchner realized and others confirmed soon after is that uh, this process was brought about by proteins called enzymes. Now, to appreciate the significance of that, uh, let me uh, just back up a moment to the way in which uh, Pasteur's experiments influenced uh, and indeed seem to accord with the preconceived notions of his contemporaries. Uh, Pasteur's uh, idea that fermentation required a living thing really gave credence uh, to uh, thousands of years of a belief uh, commonly referred to as vitalism. It can be traced back to Egyptian times. It was explicitly stated by Aristotle who made a distinction between mineral, the mineral kingdom and the animal or vegetative kingdoms. And over the ages it was argued that matter existed in two very different forms. Uh, that could be distinguished by their behavior in regard to heat. Uh, the two forms were called organic and inorganic. Inorganic matter could be melted, and then when cooled, it would return to its former state. Organic matter, on the other hand, uh, when heated or cooked, uh, was transformed. You can think of an egg or a piece of meat, uh, and changed into a new form that could not be restored to the original. So it was argued the essential difference between the two forms of matter was a vital force. Uh, that was intrinsic only in living things. Now, as I have already said, that notion was partially quashed by Pasteur's uh, disproof of spontaneous generation, but it survived and it was uh, given uh, really new uh, and important uh, recognition by his conclusion that living yeast were required for fermentation. The vital force uh, that was imagined to inhabit living things is entirely understandable to us. I mean, one is struck by the distinction between inanimate matter and whatever it might be that endows uh, living creatures with the capacity to move, uh, to 
respond to their environment, even to think. Uh, the vital force that seemed so mysterious, uh, that m was an object of understanding by, as I say, many people, including uh, great scientists over a period of 2,000 years, was finally discovered to reside in enzyme molecules that bring about conversions, uh, the simplest of which, and the first discovered, that of sugar to carbon dioxide and water. Uh, and so let me explain another way. Uh, if, sh uh, if, w if sugar and water is protected from the entry of microorganisms and left to stand, it will remain sugar and water for thousands of years. Nothing will change. On the other hand, add the enzyme that catalyzes the first and then subsequent steps of the pathway that is diagrammed here, and within a matter of seconds, seconds or less than that, the sugar is converted to carbon dioxide and water. So it is the catalysis, the speeding up of chemical reactions by enzymes that is ultimately uh, the vital force sought and that seemed to elude understanding for such a very long period of time. Now, <coughs> it is important to, to appreciate the uh, capacity of enzymes uh, to speed up chemical reactions really serves a, du a dual role. One is catalysis, and what goes hand in hand with that is control. And those two principles of catalysis, catalysis and control then inform the rest of what I have to tell you. So <coughs> I've already explained how it was uh, discovered and the importance of finding uh, that Enzymes are the basis for simple transformations, such as the capacity of yeast and indeed our own cells to convert sugar to carbon dioxide and water or to ethanol. Uh, but what about more complicated processes? Is it possible for enzymes to catalyze or to in some way to bring about what was discovered uh, what were the basis uh, of the great ideas I alluded to before concerning both genes and evolution. Uh, now, it will surprise you perhaps to know that the question of whether enzymes could be responsible for the activity of genes was important and unanswered in people's minds as recently as the 1950s. And uh, the work of great scientists during that period, which included uh, the Coreys, Ochoa, my father, and others, uh, established that enzymes were indeed capable of the important chemistry that surrounds uh, the activities of our genes. Now, I would like just to uh, introduce this second segment of what I have to tell you with some general remarks for the benefit of those who may not know uh, all of the background. So first of all, as the slide indicates, the chemical composition of genes resides in what is familiar to many as DNA. Uh, DNA is, of course, an acronym. It does not stand for dogs not allowed. <laughs> it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, the details are really not at all important. All you need to know is that uh, the substance of our genes is a molecule called DNA with two properties uh, that I'm going to explain in a moment. Now, <coughs> DNA serves two important roles. The first, self-evident from what I mentioned about the work of Mendel, namely, it is the basis of heredity. It is the transfer of the information in DNA from one generation to the next that is the basis for heredity. It is mistakes made in that or damage caused to DNA, to DNA that is the basis of evolution. The other important role of DNA is in guiding the formation and the activities of the organism itself. So it is as important to utilize the genetic information as to transmit it. Uh, the information in DNA is sufficient to define every detail of a, every living thing. And the way in which that occurs is indicated diagrammatically in this slide. Um, this is a another important idea, 
not credited by Paul Nurse as one of the uh, landmarks of biology, but I think many of us view it as absolutely essential for our understanding. It explains how the information in DNA comes to serve its important role in every living thing. The information in DNA is copied into what is called a genetic message, which in turn directs the assembly of a protein molecule. Every gene directs the assembly of a single protein molecule. Proteins are responsible for everything in nature. Proteins perform two important roles. Proteins serve structural roles uh, in the uh, formation and, I should say, in the form and function of living things, and they perform functional roles. The functional roles um, are, in the manner that I've already explained, as enzymes to catalyze and control uh, every one of the chemical processes that underlies life itself. Now, uh, the <coughs> I'm going to take advantage of uh, what we know about DNA uh, in regard to this pathway uh, to illustrate those two roles of proteins, the fun uh, structural role and the functional role. And uh, it will be helpful at least to remind you uh, of what is uh, probably inescapable. You've all heard of the double helix, um, which refers to two chains um, interwound in the manner that you see here. And the important feature of a DNA molecule is that it consists of a sequence, a chain of chemical letters that you can see here uh, in symbolic form. These chemical letters in DNA are copied into the genetic message, which has the closely related name RNA, in a process that is called transcription, which is exactly what the name implies. Transcription is copying a message from one form into another. And the only other technical term that I need to introduce, it's almost unavoidable, is the name of the protein enzyme that accomplishes that feat. And it is called RNA polymerase because it makes the RNA polymer. RNA is a long chain of building blocks or chemical letters just like DNA. This slide actually illustrates some details of that copying process. The RNA polymerase, which I will show you in atomic detail later on, is a large protein or in particular an enzyme uh, that has the capacity of splitting apart the double helix and then reading the sequence of chemical letters on one of the chains and assembling, you see here in blue, a genetic message, an RNA molecule that faithfully represents the information in the DNA chain. Now, that sequence of chemical letters in RNA dictates a sequence of building blocks of a protein, and that is the end of the story. The sequence of building blocks of a protein, the end point of this pathway, can be illustrated schematically in this manner. And as you will see in a real example that I'll show in a moment, the long chain of building blocks of a protein spontaneously folds into a compact form. It is illustrated here to emphasize the, uh, the organization uh, in this, the, the substructure in the form of individual building blocks, or here, uh, which illustrates the form that you'll see in a moment from a real protein that I tell you about, RNA polymerase. But the essential idea is that the long chain of building blocks of a protein, whose sequence is dictated by the original uh, pattern of letters in DNA, folds into a characteristic shape. Every sequence dictates a different shape, and the particular shape determines the role of the protein, whether it is a structural role, as I'll now show you, or a functional role as an enzyme, and what kind of enzyme, what process it catalyzes, uh, and how it achieves the control of that process. Now then, uh, let me just make one uh, last remark about the flow of genetic information down this pathway. It's a perhaps surprising fact, and I've told you that DNA contains the instructions for building every living thing. Uh, there is DNA present in every cell of every living thing. 
uh, what will perhaps uh, come as a surprise to those of you who don't know this already, the same DNA is present in every cell of a living thing. So we have in every one of the hundred trillion cells of our bodies a complete set of genes. We have all the genetic information in every one cell for construction of all the others. So what then distinguishes one cell from another? Uh, how does a nerve cell differ from a blood cell, differ from a liver cell, and so forth? Uh, and the answer lies in the selective use of the genetic information. Only a part of the complement of genes is put to use in any one particular cell, a different part in different cells. Uh, and understanding the selective use of genetic information uh, is really at the basis of understanding uh, cell differentiation and development, uh, the onset of diseases which represent aberrations of that process such as cancer, and it has been the goal and remains the objective of research in the field in which I work. Uh, it has been the objective of uh, research on these lines for uh, more than 50 years. Uh, and the problem is still not fully solved. Uh, later on, if people care to ask, I can explain some of what we think we know. Uh, but uh, I would emphasize this is one of the great uh, and still only partly solved so outstanding questions of our age. Now, <coughs> DNA, uh, as I have told you, uh, is present in every cell, the entire uh, DNA of the organism, and the uh, complete complement of human DNA uh, is about a meter in length. Of course, the individual chemical letters are microscopic, but to spell out the structure of a whole human being requires uh, an, a, a, a catenation of so many individual letters. Uh, the DNA molecule is a meter long. That meter length of DNA is compressed inside every one of the cells of our bodies. Now, if you try and imagine how that might occur, which is a challenge that uh, uh, concerned many people for uh, a very long time, then uh, you might bear in mind that it's a question beyond merely packaging or merely condensing such a long molecule. Uh, the condensation has to obey certain, it would seem, uh, contradictory or paradoxical rules. Um, here you see some examples of the DNA in uh, living things. This is, could be the DNA of a human cell. This is the DNA of an amphibian. This is the DNA of a fruit fly. Uh, the important thing, on the upper left, what you see um, is the DNA packaged up in what are, what are called chromosomes, which is the condensed form of DNA, migrating to the opposite poles of a single cell undergoing division. It will split in two to give rise to two daughters, and each will acquire a full complement of chromosomes. So each will have the entire length of DNA, the full set of genes. Uh, during the process of division, the chromosomes are highly condensed, uh, and so they are observable, as you see here in the light microscope. However, following cell division, uh, the contents, the chromosomes disperse, as they must to make the genes available to be read to direct the activities of the cell. Um, these are some special cases where the condensed, where the expanded form of the DNA is even observable. Uh, and that is because, for example, in the fruit fly Drosophila, in its salivary gland, there are about a thousand uh, copies of each chromosome lined up alongside each other. Uh, so that they are then observable in the light microscope. So the problem is how to package, how to uh, compact uh, a meter length of DNA inside a microscopic cell, and at the same time uh, make sure that every gene uh, that needs to be available uh, so the information can be used to direct the activities of that cell um, is uh, accessible uh, to the, to the uh, machinery that I just alluded to, namely available for transcription by RNA polymerase. And the solution to that problem, you might imagine, well, the best way of organizing a lot of material and compacting it is spooling it, wrapping it. I mean, there is no more straightforward me mechanism for doing so. But the problem you would face is if you wrap all the DNA around a spool, then how do you, once again, gain access to that on the inside where you need it? 
nature's solution to this problem, uh, which I actually found in my work, my postdoctoral work in Cambridge, England in the 1970s, is to employ that principle, but not a single spool, uh, thousands and thousands of very small spools, so that condensation is achieved, but individual parts of the uh, DNA can be made available uh, when required. And this slide simply illustrates that point. Uh, the individual spools, an example of which you see here, consist of DNA symbolized by this rope wrapped around a set of protein molecules, which is an example of a protein that serves a primarily structural role in nature. There are very many other examples. Uh, uh, hair is formed, fingernails are formed by structural proteins. Uh, muscle consists with a lot to, to a very large extent of, of a structural protein, and so on and so forth. Here is a particular example of a structural protein whose purpose is to form a mini spool about which DNA is wrapped to achieve the, go the purpose of compaction even in the most condensed states of chromosomes. Now, for the purpose of reading the genetic information by transcribing the DNA code into RNA, into the genetic message, uh, this package must be undone. It can be undone in a selective fashion without disturbing adjacent ones because there are many spools rather than a single large one. Nonetheless, it must be undone. The mechanism by which it is, the DNA is unraveled to read the information is another outstanding question of our day and one that my colleagues and I pursue uh, and uh, hope uh, in the not too far distant future we may actually uh, begin to understand. Now, <coughs> as I've said, once the DNA is unraveled, uh, then it can be transcribed, the sequence of letters copied into RNA to direct the formation of proteins to serve ultimately the roles of catalysis and control, catalysis and regulation. The uh, object of my own research for very many years has been to understand uh, the machinery that accomplishes this important process uh, to discover how the genetic information is accurately, faithfully read into a genetic message. And what I will tell you, uh, what emerges from this work is an example of an enzyme catalyst, only something very much larger than was anticipated. Uh, it's truly more than an enzyme, it's a molecular machine. Uh, and indeed, uh, we now appreciate that it is not just enzymes, but assemblies of proteins in the form of such machines that, event that will uh, provide a really adequate explanation for what I refer to as the vital force in biology, namely the capacity of living things to execute even very complex functions. Uh, this is doubtless the basis for functions as complex as neural uh, activity, uh, consciousness, and what have you, only we don't know the machinery and haven't described that yet in atomic detail. Now, in this particular case, uh, we were, after many years, successful in casting the RNA polymerase in the form of crystals, which, as you can see, are about a tenth of a millimeter in uh, their linear dimension. Uh, these are of a suitable size and contain molecules arrayed in a manner that enables the imaging of the molecules uh, by a process called X-ray diffraction. Now, because the, this particular example of a protein machine is exceptionally large, about ten times bigger than any that had been studied before, uh, a very intense beam of X-rays is needed uh, to produce the so-called diffraction pattern to solve the structure to image the molecule. Uh, the X-rays must be scattered off the component molecules within the crystalline array, uh, and then the pattern of scattered X-rays interpreted uh, to derive an image. Uh, such an intense, uh, I should say a sufficiently intense source of X-rays, uh, became available for our purposes at SLAC in about the year 2000. Uh, and literally within a matter of months when uh, one of the beam lines here was commissioned uh, that was of sufficient intensity, the structure was solved. Uh, and I should say that that was uh, thanks to the work of very many people and uh, in this particular setting I won't uh, take time to uh, list all of those involved, uh, but I will return to the point uh, in, at the very end of my lecture. <coughs> 
and comment in another way. So you'll recognize the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Some of you may recognize the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory, uh, which lies at one end of the accelerator where the information was gathered to image the molecule, the enzyme, the very large protein that reads genetic information in our cells. Uh, in this case, the machinery is made up of not one but 10 protein molecules and contains 28,000 atoms. And the image that was obtained shows the precise location of every one of the 28,000 atoms. Uh, now, it would be uh, hopelessly complicated to display uh, the precise location of 28,000 atoms, but it's useful to return to that form of representing a protein that I showed you before, namely as a chain, uh, what we refer to as a ribbon diagram. Now, this is the structure of the RNA polymerase, the gene reader in our cells, um, and uh, I'll introduce the subject with this particular uh, view. Uh, first, to explain what you see are each of the 10 proteins in a different color. So each of the 10 constituent proteins uh, uh, can be distinguished. The fifth largest of the 10 uh, is the one that is colored uh, dark pink or uh, near red here at the lower left. Uh, and this is the size of a typical protein of the sort that had been studied in the past. So that gives you a sense of the scale of this enormous structure. And again, to, and to give you an appreciation of its three-dimensional nature, I'm just going to rotate it around. Uh, and that really helps to uh, give a sense of its size and its complexity. Now, in a moment, I'll come back to a view from one side uh, and also uh, what is more important for the very next bit of information, a view down this central opening. The first thing you wonder the first thing we asked ourselves when we finally obtained an image of the gene reader is where does the gene go? Where does it enter the machine? And where does the genetic message that is made, the product RNA molecule, exit? To answer those questions, we separately image the molecule in action. So we image the molecule as a so-called transcribing complex with the gene DNA present and the RNA in the process of emerging. And to uh, explain that image, um, I'm first going to show you a view uh, down that central channel. So now I'm rotating the molecule around so that you view down the central cleft. And for simplicity, there are only two <coughs> colors instead of 10 colors. So most of the protein chain is now in white. This is that central channel. And there's only a little bit of a different color uh, whose significance you'll appreciate in a moment. Now, this slide is actually a movie. And it is made of only two frames. And each frame is an actual image of the RNA polymerase molecule. Uh, the first frame, which you see here, is the image I showed before, only depicted, as I have said, more simply with only two colors rather than 10. And the second frame is the second frame is that of the molecule in action reading the gene DNA. Now, if I stop the movie here, what you can see is that the gene DNA, which is whose two strands are colored in blue and green and form a double helix at the point of entry here, lies in that central cleft. The product genetic message emerges from that central cleft. And you may have noticed that this massive protein element, uh, which actually contains three different protein molecules, swings over the DNA and RNA in the course of forming the active complex. Now what I'm going to do is rotate around to the right for a view from the side. And then I'm going to remove the protein in white from the front. And this gives the definitive view of the RNA polymerase machine in the act of reading gene DNA, uh, all seen at near atomic resolution. Uh, again, I'm not showing the locations of all the individual atoms, but they are only indicated symbolically uh, by the protein chains and also the DNA and the RNA, the product message chains.
But what you will immediately appreciate is that the DNA double helix can be seen. It enters here from the right. And then, as I indicated to you schematically, as had been long suspected, it unwinds. The two strands separate uh, before what is called the active center of the molecule, where the process, uh, the catalysis of RNA polymerization takes place. Now, this particular slide, uh, which uh <coughs> is, has really become something of an icon and is the most famous picture, uh, depicts only part of the nucleic of the DNA and RNA. It shows the DNA entering as a double helix, but it doesn't show, it shows the strands separating, but then omits uh, the uh, strand not used to direct the formation of an RNA molecule. Also, the DNA exiting where the two strands, blue and green, recombine to form a double helix is not seen. In a very recent uh, piece of work uh, that is still in progress uh, and that has not yet been published, uh, we have succeeded in revealing the entire DNA and RNA in such an active complex. Uh, in this uh, most recent example, which uh, I won't be able to show you, uh, we can see the entire course of both green and blue strands through the structure. But the essence of it is contained in this picture, uh, which shows the genetic message in the process of assembly. The rung at the bottom of this red staircase represents the chemical letter of the genetic message, or RNA, most recently or just added to the growing chain. Uh, so the process of assembly of the genetic message proceeds from this end. And it's, it is stimulated by a magnesium ion that is symbolized by the pink sphere, which plays an important role in the process. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, and I wanted to just make two remarks by way of conclusion. And the first is to come back to what I uh, emphasized at the outset, namely uh, the importance of understanding life as chemistry. It is an article of faith amongst uh, those of us who do work on these lines that every aspect of living things uh, will eventually be understandable in terms of chemistry. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was an achievement, and it was the work of people in the 30s and 40s to describe uh, the conversion of sugar to uh, carbon dioxide and water in chemical terms. In the next generation, uh, culminating in which I've just shown you, uh, it proved possible to understand a process as complicated as gene action in chemical terms. Uh, the chemistry in this case is far more complicated. The structures involved are far larger, uh, but it has nonetheless been accomplished. Uh, and uh, all of us engaged in this work believe uh, the rep the what I have told you really only represents a beginning. Uh, and that uh, there is, um, if you like, uh, still 99% of the important information and insight to be gained, and it will come uh, in the uh, decades to follow. Now, lastly, what I wanted to do, which I think will be apparent to you from the way in which I've cast this lecture, you'll understand that our contribution is really only a small step in a very long story. It represents just a bit of a chapter of uh, a, a scientific enterprise that began hundreds of years ago. And our own contribution, uh, which uh, I illustrated, uh, is uh, a comparatively modest one. It must be seen in the context both of the great ideas uh, that have formed the basis and which uh, led to our work, and also in the context of the many who've contributed, not only those um, in times uh, gone by, but especially those responsible for the very work uh, that I mentioned, which was done so recently. Uh, so none of what I have just illustrated for you would have been possible without uh, extraordinary advances in photon physics uh, at uh, places such as uh, SLAC and the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory. The quite amazing work of literally uh, dozens and dozens of extraordinary uh, physicists who made the process of deriving an image from a crystal once we had obtained it uh, almost straightforward to do.
Uh, likewise, uh, the, biochemist, bio, the, the chemical underpinning of our work, whereby those crystals that I showed you were obtained, uh, derived not only from our own efforts, but especially from that of many who went before us. So uh, I can only conclude once again with repeating what I said at the beginning, uh, namely the debt of gratitude that I have especially to the people here, to my colleagues at Stanford and elsewhere, and I thank you all for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much. And um, usually what we do is we ask a cu couple of questions and then uh, meet at the refreshments. But I think today uh, we would like to take this unique opportunity to have uh, Roger here. Um, I, I will allow a little bit more time for questions. So please go ahead. Please. Those are very good questions. So uh, maybe I should repeat, uh, in case not everyone could hear. The first part of the question is, what is in, what is in motion here? Is the uh, DNA moving or the protein? Uh, and the second part of the question, when this machinery encounters one of those spools about which the DNA is wrapped, what are the consequences? So to answer the first part of the question, I think it's equally valid to regard the motion either with in terms of the protein or the DNA, we always think of the protein as translocating along the DNA molecule, uh, and that is the language that's commonly used to describe the process. And so viewed in that way, then, DNA is coming in, as I said, from the right and exiting from the top. Uh, I did not call your attention to an interesting point that the uh, axis of the entering DNA double helix is at right angles to the axis of the exiting uh, portion, uh, which here consists of a helix of RNA interwound with DNA, and then after that, the DNA double helix as it reforms. And that nearly right angle bend uh, of the molecule as it enters and exits uh, is very important for the chemistry. I won't take uh, time to explain the detail, but rather to come to your second question, uh, we showed many years ago, and uh, we asked that question that you posed, what happens when this moving object sliding along a DNA encounters one of the spools? And the answer is quite striking. The spool is unraveled, as I think you suggested. The DNA, the, the mach this machine, can read right around the spool and in the process disrupt it and dislodge those central structural protein molecules, which then recombine with the DNA after transcription and reform a spool again. Protein. protein. Correct. Um, and you said RNA polymerase is a protein. Correct. I don't know what starts what. This is kind of a chicken and the egg question. That's right. If you didn't have RNA polymerase, how do you do that? And my second question is if life is chemistry, as you propose, um, then is it theoretically possible to figure out how to make life? Uh -huh. But you know, those are both, the, both questions you've asked um, are so much of interest and so profound, I uh, barely know where to begin. But let me try to be brief, I'll just be, as, I'll have to be brief. In answer to your first question, uh, it is commonly believed that RNA, the, the evolution, the appearance of RNA in uh, uh, our, uh, on our planet preceded that of protein that the process of copying a gene into RNA was originally accomplished also by an RNA molecule, and that proteins only came later. Uh, now, I, to the, there are many reasons why that is thought. There is some evidence to suggest that it uh, may well be true. 
uh, that is, uh, I think it would be fair to say, uh, the uh, most common, uh, the most widespread belief at the present time. So the solution of the chicken or egg problem uh, is really, if you will, it favors the chicken, the RNA came first. Uh, but in particular, the way it did was by RNA itself being able to serve a catalytic role, which today is reserved largely, though not entirely, for proteins. Um, RNA molecules could not only catalyze the formation of RNA, but other processes, uh, including uh, many of the transformations, also essential for life. Uh, later on, RNA learned to make proteins, and proteins simply did the job better, faster, with better control, and more efficiently. Uh, now, in answer uh, to your second question, uh, there is good evidence today that aging is programmed genetically, and the, some of the observations would be well known to you. Uh, the lifespan of a, 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 a mouse has a genome. Uh, I should say the genes of a mouse are virtually identical to those of a human, but a mouse lives, has a lifespan of a year or two and a human of nearly a hundred years. Uh, now to make it more to the point, uh, people around the world have identified genes that are responsible for aging. Uh, it would be reasonable to imagine uh, that aging serves an important uh, role in evolution. You don't want the previous generation hanging around too long to compete with a new one. You want to allow, you want to allow for uh, evolution to take place through the <coughs> progression of many generations. And it's simply something that ha it happens for various reasons on a uh, shorter time frame in the mouse than it does in a human, or an elephant for that matter. Uh, on an even shorter time frame in uh, microorganisms. So that being said, then I think it would be reasonable to imagine one day we will be able to prevent aging uh, if we would really wish to do so. So your question actually has two answers. Uh, the first part of the answer is the first of the two steps of that pathway is reversible. Now, it's not always reversible, uh, but there uh, was an important discovery made about 30 years ago that in some cases one does actually copy information from RNA back into DNA, and the enzyme that does that has the appropriate name reverse transcriptase. Uh, many cancer viruses uh, have RNA rather than DNA uh, as their genetic material, but then they copy it through the action of these reverse transcriptases into DNA for insertion in our genomes, for insertion in, in uh, the DNA of our own cells. Now, in regard to this, the second answer to your question is uh, a bit more complicated. Proteins. Uh, cannot be copied back into RNA. So the direct reversal does not occur, um, or for that matter, into DNA. However, all the regulation of DNA and its activities is due to proteins. And so there is truly feedback in the sense that the copying into a protein can be trolled by action of the protein back upon the original DNA. Other questions? Yeah, uh, Excuse me. The Yes, so for the most part, uh, so the question was whether, uh, what, 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 w the observation was made that the DNA is, is right-handed, but the questioner may um, have known, uh, or at least seem to indicate what uh, has been discovered, that there are cases in which the coiling of the DNA double helix is in the opposite or left-handed sense. And uh, there are, 
the, 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 a full answer to the question about the interaction between the left and the right-handed forms uh, would require many hours of lecture. Uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the short of it is that uh, we do not yet know for certain whether truly left-handed DNA occurs in our bodies and plays uh, a physiological role. However, it can be demonstrated, uh, it can be proved to exist uh, in a cell-free system, so outside of our bodies. And what is uh, the basis of that far more detailed answer to which I alluded, uh, <coughs> subtle variations in the coiling uh, have much to do with both this process and its regulation, but that would lie beyond uh, what I have the capacity to describe. Yes, so I'll explain. So uh, I glossed over that in the interests of time and, Again, oh, the question was, <coughs> how can the amount of information that is required to produce such a picture uh, showing the location of every one of 28,000 atoms be derived from X-ray diffraction? Um, is the pattern really so richly informative? And the answer uh, is, uh, as follows, and I, I simply didn't take time, so I couldn't elaborate in the course of the lecture about the methodology itself. Uh, the, the essence of what one does is truly imaging, uh, as would be performed with an optical system. If you shine light on an object of any size, uh, then uh, photons that are scattered off the component parts of the object are focused through a lens to produce an image, uh, which we perceive. Um, X-ray diffraction works exactly the same way. Uh, photons, in this case very high energy photons, are scattered off uh, the electrons of the molecule. Uh, and then they must be, in some manner, focused to construct an image. Now the problem is that X-ray lenses, certainly of the sort that we would be required, don't exist. So that part has to be done, as it were, manually or by computation. So the scattered x-rays are recorded. Um, it used to be on photographic film, now using a CCD, a charge coupled display detector. Uh, and uh, then the entire pattern of all the scattered uh, x-rays is uh, converted to an image through a mechanism exactly the same as what a lens does, except using a computer. Uh, the, it happens that the when one starts from not an individual molecule, if one started from an individual molecule, one would have a diffuse pattern of scattered X-ray photons uh, that would be focused on, that could be focused or whose, uh, from which a structure could be computed in the manner that I've described through simulating the action of a lens. Uh, that simulation has a mathematical term, it's called Fourier transformation, but it is essentially the same thing. Uh, the reason why we need a crystal and uh, is because we can't scatter, because the, the scattering of the x-rays off of, uh, the atoms of a molecule would just, in fact, destroys it. And you can't even scatter enough photons off one molecule to, f to locate its position, much less the arrangement of atoms within it. So we need many, many thousands of molecules uh, each one of which will contribute only a small part of the picture. When, the, uh, when a crystal is used, uh, then it produces uh, an intermediate pattern uh, from which we compute the structure by imaging uh, that is an array of dots uh, corresponding to the locations of all the atoms, of all the molecules in the crystal. And uh, such an array, such an image, an array of dots is called a diffraction pattern. There are hundreds of thousands of such uh, dots whose intensities we record to produce uh, our image. So the amount of information is indeed very great. Uh, the exact intensities in hundreds of thousands of such dots to eventually determine the location of 28,000 atoms. So one all the way uh, in the back, the, the red shot, please. 
Uh, yeah, that was, th that was uh, there are people who worked on that problem who can tell you that they, uh, they practically died in the process. Uh, so all the while that we were struggling to form crystals and then determine the structure of the molecule on its own, this collection of 10 proteins that form the machine, we were trying to figure out how to do just that. And the problem is that, of course, the machine in action uh, is in a ordinarily would be in a state of motion, uh, and moreover, uh, is particularly fragile. Its existence is transient. Uh, so uh, the first part of the problem was solved by simply omitting one of the chemical letters that is required so the enzyme or the machinery would stall at a fixed point in the process. So now we had something that was, as it were, frozen, uh, but still very fragile. And then to deal with that issue required about 10 years of struggle uh, by people, by my colleagues, one of whom in particular really bore the brunt of it and uh, uh, was on the verge of quitting many times. Uh, he was so discouraged. Uh, in the midst of this effort, uh, he would most days just sit at the computer playing computer games because he really <laughs> couldn't, just couldn't bear to contend with the uh, problem. And, you know, I understood that it was uh, soul destroying work, and so I looked the other way. And <laughs> finally, finally, after, in his case, eight years of fruitless effort, he solved the problem. He managed to produce a crystal containing the enzyme in action, so uh, stalled, and then with its delicate structure preserved so that we could image it and see the structure. <laughs> Say that one more time. Oh, so. So the question is, what are the advantages of embryonic stem cells? And uh, I think it's a relevant question because the process that we study forms the basis by which stem cells give rise to the many different cell types required uh, for medical purposes or which they are capable of doing for whatever reason. So the straight answer to your question, what is the, why, do, why does one want embryonic stem cells, is because they have the capacity of being uh, transformed uh, into virtually any tissue, uh, and people imagine that that may serve the purpose of replacing diseased or damaged tissue, uh, for example. Now, again, the differentiation of an embryonic cell into one of a particular type, like muscle, nerve, or what have you, uh, relies upon exactly what I described regulated transcription. It relies upon uh, the turning on of the appropriate genes and turning off of the ones that are not required in a particular cell type to achieve that purpose. Now, I indicated that the way in which such turning on and off happens is still an object of our study. We know a good deal about it that there really wasn't time to describe, but I think it would be fair to say we've not yet solved that problem. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can you repeat the question? So the question is, well, how in fact is the process appropriately regulated with regard to uh, which gene to read, where to start? Um, so to find the beginning of the gene, of course, where to finish at the end of the gene, uh, and so forth. And uh, what is the role of all the many different subunits, and how do they contribute uh, to this overall process? So I can only uh, very briefly mention the following. First of all, what I showed you, the polymerase alone, is incapable of finding the start site, so the beginning of a gene. It is even incapable of beginning the process of transcription. All it can do is extend uh, a growing RNA chain in the manner that was illustrated by that last picture. In 
beyond that, it's uh, utterly insensitive to regulatory influences. Okay. The, for finding the beginning of a gene and starting the process, another 16 proteins are required. Now, our work of the, and, and that of others during the course of the 1980s identified all those proteins. And then this, the picture that I've shown you uh, really formed the starting point for imaging the larger uh, assembly formed by the RNA polymerase with those 16 additional proteins. We have done that. We understand how it finds the beginning of a gene and how it initiates transcription, but there was just not time uh, and it would have been impossible to go into such detail. Uh, I, I can refer you to the papers or maybe tell you about it another time. Beyond that it lies the question of regulation. How, in fact, do spe is cell specificity achieved? How do environmental influences <coughs> impinge upon the RNA polymerase? Also, to determine which genes are transcribed where and to what extent and at what time in the life of an organism. Well, uh, here my own colleagues made a particular contribution. We discovered in the course of the 1990s something remarkable, which uh, again, there's no time to tell you about in detail. We discovered uh, an assembly of 21 protein molecules. Uh, we first found it in yeast and people doubted whether it was relevant to humans. Now we know it occurs in every so-called eukaryote organism from uh, single cell creatures like yeast to complex multicellular organisms like humans and plants. The same 21 protein complex which receives all the regulatory information, functions as a molecular computer to interpret that information and then delivers the appropriate signal to the RNA polymerase machine that I showed you. Okay, I would say we have three more questions. Yes. So to answer the second part of your question first, how many times uh, does such gene reading occur in the lifetime of a cell? The answer is that there are not only many thousands of genes, uh, hundreds to thousands of which are read many times in the life of a cell, uh, but there is much additional transcription that goes on to produce not uh, genetic messages that code for proteins, but now we know, uh, and there's particular excitement about the observation, also RNA molecules which function independently to serve important uh, functional and in particular regulatory purposes. So in fact, in the, uh, the year 2006 when I received the prize, uh, that in medicine, in chemistry, the one in medicine went to Andrew Fire, also here in the School of Medicine, and Craig Mello in Massachusetts who were the first to report the regulatory role of RNA molecules, uh, also made by transcription, uh, uh, in addition to all of what I have just alluded to. Uh, so not only are there many thousands of such events for producing proteins, but there are many, perhaps even more, uh, to produce RNA molecules that serve no purpose in making proteins but feedback to produce regulation. Now, on the first part of your question, in a way, the picture I, picture I showed is misleading. It showed the RNA intertwined with the DNA in a right-handed helix. But the RNA only exists transiently in that state when associated with the, the gene-reading machine, the RNA polymerase. After that is, uh, other we've, we've since produced pictures that show uh, what I couldn't elaborate on here, how the RNA is peeled off that DNA strand and it is released into solution uh, to proceed to another destination to direct the formation of a protein, that RNA is a single strand, and a single strand cannot have a defined hand, either left or right-handed. And uh, did you answer the question of how often it happens? Yes, so the, the answer to how often it happens is, again, many thousands of times in the life of a cell. 
even beyond what you might imagine from what I said, not only to make proteins, but also to make RNA. Okay, so let's do one more here. So the question is, what does this imply with respect to the creation of life? And that, of course, is the hardest question to answer because uh, there we're really only presented with the products of the creation of life. Uh, there are famous experiments that have been done, been done, which demonstrate the possibility of formation of the molecules of life. Uh, in, pre in, in, in conditions of a prebiotic world. Uh, and, uh, but not much progress has been made, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, beyond that. We really don't understand how the rare event, perhaps the unique event, of the coalescence of such molecules into the first living things occurred. Uh, we imagine that uh, molecules like the simplest forms of RNA whose components we know could have existed, would be formed under prebiotic conditions, may have been captured uh, by a simple cell envelope or membrane, and once uh, protected or concentrated there, might conceivably uh, have uh, gained the capacity for reproduction, but we don't know. Yeah. So the question, so the, 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 the question in its most general form concerns, uh, uh, as it were, add-ons or appendages, uh, 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 additional marks that uh, decorate the genetic information in DNA uh, that give it still further specificity. And to uh, explain what is meant by that, uh, and the best known example, well, I should say, first of all, that the DNA itself can be chemically modified in cells, and that enables an important distinction in humans and other mammals between the parental copies, between the maternal and the paternal copies of a gene that are received uh, by the progeny. Uh, the more remarkable example of such chemical marking of chromosomal material lies in the chemical modification of the structural proteins about which the DNA is wrapped. Uh, there is an astonishing variety of such modifications, uh, and uh, they, together with the modifications of the DNA, fall in this general category that the questioner referred to as epigenetic or extragenetic information. And the answer to your question is in part the, to the, the question you posed is in part known you asked whether there is crystallographic information that relates and helps us understand uh, the role of these uh, so-called epigenetic marks on the protein and on the DNA. Uh, indeed, there are many crystal structures of the proteins that introduce the marks and of the proteins that read the marks. Uh, there is not a satisfying complete description of the process uh, that is a result of such marking. However, I might just conclude the answer to your question with saying our own studies of the past decade have, I think, uh, led to the conclusion uh, marking the proteins uh, performs at least one important role. Uh, the marked proteins are intermediates in the process of unraveling the DNA from those many spools. Uh, so in order for a gene to become available and read, uh, as I have already said, such unraveling must occur. And the unraveling is a multi-stage process. And along the way, it involves the introduction and the removal of chemical marks on the proteins. 
Uh, with that, I would like to uh, please let you join me in thanking the speaker again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, please stay around for some of the refreshments. Uh, I think Roger might be here still for a couple of more minutes. And uh, I hope to see you again in two months. Bye.